She said to me that I shouldn't be ashamed of being afraid. Fear is in all of us. It's how we learn to conquer that fear. And that is what the story illustrates. Um, this is a celebratory morning, evening for Ila. Welcome to uh, our launch of Ila's book, Courage. This is uh, a day that we will be celebrating the power of courage and its relationship to nonviolence. Um, it seems that these two uh, ideas, nonviolence and courage, are really inseparable. And so it's just wonderful when to be able to be here with all of you and really think about where courage is happening in our world today and where we need more of it and what we can do to contribute to the, the world being a more courageous one. Um, and so we have this beautiful book for children that is based on an animation that we uh, we did with Ela last year. I'm going to put it in the chat. And we decided that we would just, what what if we turn this animation into a book for children? It's just a round of applause for Ela for the book project. Just for me. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's for all the whole team. Mm. We'll put it and together. We've had um, yes, we had a beautiful um work of team uh, uh Moreau, Sliba, Sobo, and Irvin um helped us put the book together from design in the back end. Sophia is working on helping to let people know about it and um our wonderful board at the Meta Center also is helping to promote it. And you are, um, you're on the board, but you're also promoting it through other means. So let's put it out there. We also have, um, would like to thank the Gandhi Foundation for uh, sponsoring um, some of the book. Thank you very much for their work to help promote the legacy of Gandhi, which we'll talk more about why the story is tied into that. Um, and also our friends at uh, Kadi London, uh, our friend Asha uh, was uh, a player as we were trying to let people know about uh, sponsoring uh, the book and she helped us with that. So we're very grateful to Asha. Uh, and also our friend uh, Mohan Trivedi, who's here, he um, is helping to have the book published in India as well. So that's wonderful. Okay, so I, I wonder, I'll just pass it to you, Michael, say a few words, and then we'll pass it to yeah. Ila. Yeah. yeah, the thought that's been on my mind all morning is something that uh, Gandhiji, I think, said about courage. And he, he said that that was the first of all the virtues, that without courage, nothing else would work. With courage you can basically reach all the other virtues that you need to find out who you are, express yourself, and make your best contribution to the world. So, of course, uh, in, uh, in Sanskrit, most of these words for these great uh, virtues and capacities of the human being are expressed by negating the opposite. So the Sanskrit word for courage is abhaya, which means no fear. And that is often how Bapu himself expressed it. He said, you have to shed all fear. And once you do that, you cannot be dominated. Nobody can really hold anything over you. Uh, it has been pointed out that, well, in fact, it was Gandhi who pointed out that the law does not say the law cannot say, it has no such capacity, the law cannot say, you must do such and such. All it can say is, if you don't do such and such, we'll do something you don't like. <laughs> and if you have the courage to resist that, to endure and persist, you can be completely free. So I, I believe that was really a, a key 
to Gandhi's person and his his ability to make such an incredible contribution to the modern world, which uh, I think you know, two generations later, we still have really not yet appreciated what he gave us. And so that's that's why we're so happy to have this book. Gandhi also said, if you want peace, you must begin with the children. So this is what we're doing. <laughs> and now let me introduce our uh, dear friend and board member and relative of the Mahatma, uh, whose narration forms the story in this book, Ila Gandhi. Please join us, Ila. Are you now in Durban? Yes, I am. I'm in Durban. And thank you so much for, you know, bringing this book um, so beautifully to the children. And um, yeah, so as you said, you know, Gandhiji always said that nonviolence requires more courage than violence. You need much more courage to be nonviolent. And so courage was an important element in his life. He learned it, of course, from Kasturba. And that's where he realized that courage can uh, become a reality by conquering your fear. So that relationship between fear and courage. And uh, that is what happened between Kasturba and uh, Gandhiji. The two of them you know, uh, and he learned it from her because um, she was, you know, completely courageous and had conquered her fears. So, um, yeah, that is what I tried to show in this book, but you have taken it to another level. And thank you for all of you, all the people who are involved in this work. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the story of the book? Um, we'd love for you to, to tell the story and how, how you learned the story. So as a child, you know, uh, I grew up at Phoenix Settlement which was established by Gandhiji in 1904. And this year we celebrate 120 years. So this book is just on time as a celebratory, uh, you know, uh, work. So <clears throat> growing up at Phoenix Settlement, we encountered a lot of snakes. And um, there was no electricity, so it was dark at Phoenix. Um, we had to have paraffin lamps and rely on torches and things like that. So darkness, snakes, all of these things that bring fear in little children in particular was there. And I was quite scared of all those things. And then my mother told me the story about Gandhiji, and she said to me that I shouldn't be a, shouldn't be ashamed of being afraid. Fear is in all of us. It's how we learn to conquer that fear, and that is what the story illustrates. That Gandhiji too was scared when he was a child, and even when he came to live at Phoenix Settlement, he saw lots of snakes. But um, that didn't deter him from coming to live there. He could have just shied away and said, no, no, this is too fearful. Let me not stay in this place. But he came to stay, and then he conquered his fear. He refused to sleep. Um, indoors where possibly snakes would find it difficult to come in in the house. He slept on the veranda in the breeze and, you know, there were no air conditioners or anything. South Africa is quite hot. 
um, you know, in the summer months, and it's pleasant outside on the stoop to um, uh, to sleep and to get the fresh air. So he slept on the stoop, and then the snake came along and <laughs> slithered over him. And at first he was scared when he saw the snake, but then he just lay still. This is what my mother told me, uh, the story of this. And that was conquering his fear. What he learned on that day is that there's more fear in the mind. You are scared that the snake is going to, you know, bite you or, you know, all the things that make you afraid of um, these kinds of animals um, and the creepy crawly animals. A lot of people are afraid of them. And uh, he conquered his fear by just staying there and um, lying still. And later he said that maybe the snake was more afraid of me than I was of the snake. So, yeah. Good. Yeah, I would just like to add one thing, uh, Ela, for our uh, non-Indian friends who are on the call with us here. And that is, you may not realize, you know, here in the West, a very small proportion of snakes are dangerous. Most snakes are quite harmless. But in India, there's quite a number of what was called in Sanskrit, Krishna Sarpa, or literally means black snake. But that's what we call a cobra. And if you're bitten by a cobra, you don't have much of a chance, really. Mm -hmm. You might be able to get to a vishavaidya, you know, a poison doctor in time, or you might not. So there's a very deep in inbuilt fear of snakes, which is very reasonable. And he was living in South Africa. And there he was living in South Africa, where they have black mambas and other very very poisonous creatures so i think we have to appreciate that so yes thank you for putting in that uh, section on snakes because it's also important for children to know uh, and in many parts of africa australia india other countries as well there they are snakes that are very harmful but we just have to uh, be careful. That was actually a suggestion from our friend uh, Andre Young, who did the book Remember This Always with Meta. She's also, um, she'd been a longtime Montessori teacher. And when she read the book, she said, it should, you should have a section in at the end about getting to know snakes. So that, um, thank you, Michael. Um, so that with as this is a book about nonviolence, learning that the way that we can become curious about snakes and respect their environment and live in harmony with snakes as much as possible. Um, and so there's some questions to help children um, learn to honor and respect other life forms in this. Um, so yeah, thank you for the reminder. Now, Ila, you um, are talking about how this story has helped to bring you courage in your life. Um, and when I, I want you to talk a little bit about how, about your background in, in politics and South Africa and um, how fear has come into it and, and how courage has brought you out of the fear. Because you have a, a, one, a wonderful story about yourself? Yeah, there were many instances in South Africa where we had to decide whether we want to participate in demonstrations, in, uh, you know, uh, marches and uh, those kinds of confrontations with the police and uh, with the, the law because the law can come down quite heavily on people. 
uh, some people have lost their lives. Uh, I can recall on one occasion when I was standing with the with the banner demonstrating uh, against the tricameral system that we had in South Africa. And uh, the police vans just arrived and picked us up and threw us into the van. And uh, I am claustrophobic. And, you know, to be on the back of this police van with no windows, nothing, you know, just closed. And uh, it was quite um, scary, fearful, uh, you know. And I thought of the story and I remembered that, you know, if you give in, succumb to your fear, you can become quite ill and you can harm yourself. But you have to do something to overcome that fear. And in that moment, I just thought, I'm not a singer at all. I can't sing for nuts. But at that time, you know, I said, we shall overcome is a song that, you know, came to my mind. And I just started singing it in the van. And I think that singing gave me air to breathe. Uh, deeply, and uh, it also took away the fear, gave me courage to face it. So, yeah. Whew, what you. a wonderful story, Ila. You know, you know, there is a movie that was made about the uh, civil rights movement. It's with Whoopi Goldberg. It's called The Long Walk Home. And it describes a scene. Of course, this is fictional, but it's very true to life of things that often happened. A bunch of uh, marchers are getting ready, black and white, getting ready to march out together. And a very menacing mob blocked them. And they're capable of violence. Uh, and they did. the marchers didn't know what to do. Whoopi Goldberg started singing a uh, spiritual uh, part of the words where I have my faith in Jesus and I'm going on. And the women simply marched slowly, singing right through those men. And there was even, there was another case uh, where the, the, women, the marchers were having a meeting in a building and the, some of the sheriff's men turned off the lights so suddenly they were in this completely dark room with oh. policemen round about. And w once again, one of them started singing. I think she was singing, We Shall Overcome. And uh, everyone was encouraged. And one of the policemen actually said to her, will you stop that darn singing? Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he knew instinctively, and this is what we're really saying here and that what's this is what you were saying with the book that if you conquer your fear you cannot be controlled by anyone absolutely yeah and the flip side if you succumb to it you can really become quite ill it will have an effect on yourself so know that that's true of anger also if you harbor anger it will yes. make you ill in fact uh, a friend of mine was talking to a tibetan monk who had fled from tibet and he never showed the slightest resentment or animosity toward the chinese and my friend asked him how can you go through all of this without getting angry and the man said there is no poison in here. And that was very, very telling. We only realized that when we harbor anger or fear, we're really poisoning ourselves at a very deep level. That would be such a profound thing to learn. Yeah. Now, what about the our, our board member Susan Rockrise is here today and Hi, Susan. I know that because of uh, 
the setup, it's hard for you to talk. Um, but if you'd like to say something, I can unmute you. Um, can everybody, is it, can everyone hear us? Can Amory, can you hear us in here? Just checking. Cause someone just said someone can't hear us. Okay. Thank you, Sophia. Hi. Um, okay, Mohan, I think there might be a problem with your audio because other people can hear us. So you might sign off and sign back on. Um, but that courage has the, um, in English comes from the word, you know, from the heart, the, yeah. you know, and yeah. it, it symbolizes the heart in a lot of ways that courage, this is, it takes, which so does nonviolence, you know, nonviolence is an act of love. It comes from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not enough just not to be afraid in a way, but that there's this other force that's a part of an act of courage. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you can say something about that and if you have any examples. Yes, I think... Um... It does come from the heart and, uh, you know, the flip side, you, you have courage and you don't have courage. So when you don't have courage, it's fear that grips you. And that is what grips your heart. So when you are fearful, if you think about it, you know, if you are afraid, you find that your heart beat is faster. You begin to feel, you know, that uh, within you, uh, the fear, you know, that grips you and it's inside you. So um, to have courage, you have to be able, you have to learn how to overcome fear. And I think it's explained very beautifully in the book by, at the end, where the questions are for the children. And I found that that was very well, you know, done and presented there at the end, where children are, you know, taught that you can take deep breaths and by taking deep breaths, you begin to lessen the heartbeat. And by the heartbeat becoming more regular instead of uh, panicking, you um, overcome the fear and then you get courage. By overcoming fear, you begin to be courageous. Mm. Yeah. And, and and one thing that I wanted to add into those questions uh, for schools, because this is a great book for um, teachers to read in a classroom or read with children or as parents uh, or friends of children to read with them and do these activities about how to develop our courage. Um, one thing that I really wanted to help bring out with that is um, when Gandhi has the snake going over him and there's this idea of doing doing nothing in that situation um it feel or it looks like it sounds like it's he's doing nothing but what he's doing is conquering his fear and in some situations uh where most of us aren't dealing with a snake going over us it's the right action isn't to to lay there and do do nothing right it's to um to do something so i i just really wanted to bring that out that it's um it might have looked like he was staying there and he was afraid, but there was something else happening. Do you, mm -hmm. you see what I'm getting yeah. to? Yeah, okay. Martin Luther King expresses this very well when he was uh, given the usual uh, criticism about nonviolence. Someone said that it's passive. You're just being passive. And he explained, as a matter of fact, you're being extremely active first and foremost, by conquering negative forces within you. That's an extremely active thing to do, except it happens not to involve uh, your muscles and the body at that moment. So that's how I think of what Gandhiji was doing when that snake was approaching him, that he was really uh, working very hard, though his body may have been still. He was converting that turmoil 
within him into a positive state of uh, balance or tranquility. Mm -hmm. And as Stephanie's been saying, that is the that's the sine qua known for nonviolence. If you want to be nonviolent, this is the first thing you have to do. If you rush out onto a demonstration and you haven't done that, uh, you're not at the very best. You're not going to be much, very effective. You could you could even uh, make things worse. Yes. So, well, you know, if you take that analogy of the snake, uh, if our instincts, if we, you know, sort of the instinctive reaction would be either to run or to try to remove the snake or do something like that. And those are the things that could get you into more trouble because the snake can bite you then or it can, uh, you know, uh, chase you if it was poisonous and uh, mamba, it will go after you if you were to run. Whereas mm -hmm. lying still like that, they probably think that this person is, uh, you know, it's not a person, it's dead, whatever it is. And they would go over. So that's in the instance of a snake. But if you take other you know, life situations where, for instance, you are being questioned by the police, interrogated, tortured. Um, if you, you know, learn to conquer that fear in you and you learn to control your mind and, you know, and don't react instinctively, but just, you know, stay still. Uh, it can help you because, um, you know, the, the, the uh, torture and, you know, the methods that uh, police use when you are in detention and things like that, people have talked about it. And they say that, you know, before it happens to you, you are very scared. But once it happens to you, you realize that, you know, you can, you can take it. You have the courage to accept it. No matter how hard they hit you, what they do, you can just, you know, the pain is there, but you accept the pain. You know, Ila, I read a statement uh, recently by someone who said, death is not painful. The fear of death is very painful. Absolutely. Yeah. We have yeah. some questions coming up, ah, so I do okay. want to be able to invite people to ask some questions. Yeah. If you... Hey, Marie, you're up. Okay. Um, but it's great to see you all and be hearing your story. Ila, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, one thing that I heard early off that I'm interested in, I heard you um, mention Gandhi as a, a, a younger person being influenced by others. And I'm wondering if you could say again, or if I could hear how or who um, that was that he was learning his principles from or his outlook from. Okay, so he was learning from his wife. You know, Gandhiji got married at age 13. He was a very young boy then. And his wife was also 13 years old. And he says in his autobiography that uh, it, he learned how to be courageous from his wife. Because she always stood up, you know, to... Um, do what she considered to be the correct thing to do. She wasn't afraid. Gandhiji himself would try to bully her and tell her, you can't do this and you can't go to certain functions and things like that. And she would just go and accept whatever, you know, if he got angry or whatever he wanted to do, he can do, but she was going to go. And nobody could stop her. 
<laughs> oh, that's so wonderful. I love hearing that. Yeah. Thank you. If I remember correctly, in those early years, Gandhiji was afraid of the dark, and he yes. used to ask Kasturba to go with him. So, so he was a man who later on, the greatest empire the world has ever seen, could not frighten him. Yes. And back then, as a young, as a teenager, he was afraid of the dark. Yes. It, it's a remarkable story of transformation. Mm. So inspiring. Yeah. Thank you. A remarkable story about Kasturba, who helped to change him, you know. Mm. We don't hear about those things. They are not told so uh, widely, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we have another question from Rama Singh. Let me see if I can at least bring his audio up. Uh, I want to thank first uh, Mohan Bhai for you know, sending me the information, which I got just an hour ago. <laughs> now I'm very pleased. And I want to thank uh, Nagler Bhai for hosting it. And the young lady, I don't know the name. And of course, Ira Ben for uh, you know, giving this talk. I mean, I just... Uh, I see from from hearing her, uh, the you know what the book is intended for. I'm assuming it's the children's book, and the reason yeah. really I you know uh, it's it's not just enough to know what level the book is for. Uh, being a scientist <laughs> who are always worrying about information, <laughs> more and more and more of it, and uh, I you know think that. Uh, the piece has not only to do with information, with what information and at what level to receive and teach. And I think that, you know, children's uh, trying to reach out to children uh, uh, about peace and courage. And I think really that these words, we, we talk and they fly by and, you know, parents to children and uh, every day, we, we take it for granted. And, and the word had no weight. Uh, I mean, the word courage, I mean, think about, you know, it is amazing that how much you can, you know, cover about life, just about going through that one word, rather than writing a book about, let's say, peace, which immediately would sound like everything. And, you know, uh, so I really, I'm very uh, eager to receive a copy and read it. And mm -hmm. I have uh, two, 14-year-old uh, granddaughters uh, whom I'm in a baby taking today. So I, I would love to give them a gift. So thank oh. you, Ella Ben, for writing the book, and I will order it. But this is Rama yeah. Singh, in case you did not get a from, a from McMaster University. Mm. McMaster. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ramaji. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, did you want to say some words about um, the age that you think the book would be appropriate for, or is it for everybody? I mean, the the story of Gandhi, it helps, uh, it could help children, but I imagine that it, I mean, it would help all of us to know that story. So in a way, children's books are special because um, they're not just for children but they just simplify to the key, you know, message to, in such a simple and elegant way, a, 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 a story that's important for all of us to learn, a, you know, a principle of nonviolence. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in the way that I, I mean, I guess I could also speak to that. We did design it to be used in um, classrooms for, younger children with questions and activities for thinking about living in harmony with snakes or what do you do when you're afraid? Um, those questions are really aimed at a young, a much younger audience, but I think we can still all ask ourselves that question yeah. too. What do you do when you're yeah. feeling fear? Mm -hmm. What do you think, Ila? <laughs> yes, I think it's uh, important for all of us uh, like I said, you know, Gandhiji learned in his early days 
to um, conquer fear because it's all about conquering fear. It's not just about courage, but it's about how you conquer fear to become courageous. And uh, today, you know, we see in uh, society, there's so much of violence. There's so much of, um, you know, bullying in schools and so on. And um, children need to know how they can deal with these things. Often what happens is that when you are afraid, you begin to, your, your whole um, self-image begins to suffer because you feel that you, you know, you, you are scared, you are afraid of everything and, you know, you are a lesser human being. Simply because maybe you are not so muscular, maybe because you can't hit out at the other person, and that is not the criteria for courage. The criteria for courage comes from within, when you can actually conquer that fear that lies within you. That's when you become courageous and you have a better self-image of yourself. So I think that that's very important for children, for even adults, all of us, um, to think about these issues when we reading a story like that. Yeah. We have a, a comment here from our friend Margarita. I'm going to bring you on to talk if you'd like to. Oh, I just said that children's books are oftentimes written in a way that even grown-ups can understand. And I just so appreciate that about your book. Thank you. Let's see. I think uh, I must say that thank you so much to Meta Center and to all the people who have helped to put that book in a way that it has become so accessible to people. Mm. It's so uh, something, you. yeah, we, some, well, it was a great honor to work with you on this and um, we, we're definitely gonna make sure that you get um, many copies um, for your work in South Africa. Um, so if anybody is headed to South Africa, we can send you along with the whole box of books for the event. Um, our friend Susan Rockrise is here. She wants to say a few words. I'm going to bring her up to talk. Thank you. I, this is all new to me. <laughs> anyway, I could say a lot about this, but I'm going to try and be brief. Ela, it's lovely to see you. Michael, I love you. Stephanie, I love you. I love all of you. I love everybody I don't see. Um, I have a few things I learned from my family, and one of them is... Um, and Ila, you can probably put this into perspective. This phrase I was taught when I was a young child about how to live my life, one of the many gifts my mother gave me was, Susie, please remember to have the courage to believe what you already know to be true in your gut. That's number one. From there... I went forward into the world of technology in my career, and I realized that everybody that I worked with in technology was very, 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 very smart in their mind, but they had difficulty expressing their feelings. And so on all of my business cards for 45 years on the back, which is normally a wasted space for communication, I wrote two words, have courage. When people turned that card around, quite naturally just flipping it around and they saw those words, you could see their face light up. There is something about that. I don't know what they saw in it. I, it was just different, I think. But I've been trying to encourage humans to be courageous, to have courage. And in all of my meetings that were very smart meetings with technological leaders, I would eventually get frustrated because I would say, now, we're going to stop thinking for a moment and I want you to listen carefully to your instincts and tell me your truth. Have courage. What do you feel about this idea or that idea? 
and instantaneously they would light up and they'd say things quickly and honestly. And the problems became more well resolved with the blend of the mind and the heart. So I am a very big cheerleader for the notion of courage. I love people who encourage those others to have that courage to get over their fear, to conquer their fear, and to be more truthful about who they really are and have that self-image. And I don't have a lot of um, time for discouragement. So I don't like D-I-S, I like E-N in front of words. And um, so I just want to end this little tiny moment with great gratitude to you. The story meant the world to me. The video that Stephanie produced, which has not yet been mentioned, is extremely beautiful. And I don't know if you're going to make that available to everybody, uh, but it's so it's so well done. And um, I watched some of the speeches last night uh, at the Democratic Convention. And what struck me more than anything else was the depth of courage and fearlessness that people found at last as they spoke to others in their encouragement of finding what it takes to be fearless and do the right thing. So you guys have helped me today massively by understanding that courage is the first step to nonviolence. Courage is the first step to non-self courage is the first step to all sorts of things, almost everything. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. There's a, there is a statement that I'm trying to remember. Uh, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it, it says very in very simple language that courage is what fundamentally makes us human. Courage is the core uh, and to, uh, phenomenon, if you will, uh, of being a human being. And I, I think I'm going to try to find that mm. and uh, send it around to everyone. It would be a beautiful compliment to this beautiful book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have Asha. Uh -huh. Asha. Three continents. Namaste, Laji. Namaste. Um, I keep loving hearing these stories again and again and again for two reasons. As Michael said, it was such a high leap from a boy who was scared of everything to say the mighty empire in a very quiet voice, quit India or stop violence, and it happened. It was a leap like from going from sea level to climbing the Everest in terms of showing courage. The second reason I like these stories is in this world, in this day and age, it's very hard to believe that courage, abha, is the road to nonviolence. Now, I understand this. But my problem is, how can I explain to children and the adult around me, how do you link abhay with nonviolence, abhay with ahinsa? Can you explain, please? So, I don't know, Michael, if you'd like to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't, it doesn't. It didn't come as a question, but as a statement, and I, I fully appreciated it, Asha. I really, uh, really like what you have to say. Uh, I wanted to just share a very small anecdote here. When I was leaving campus once years ago, when I was a professor, there was a time of very intense uh, tension. I was leaving campus and we were threatened. I was with one colleague. We were threatened by four people who were very menacing and could have been very, very dangerous to us. But uh, for some reason, I wasn't immediately afraid. 
I grabbed my colleague's arm and, and just led him away from that. Hmm. When we got far enough away, we could turn back and look at these guys who had been threatening us so severely. And what I saw very clearly from their body language was they were relieved. Mm. They were relieved that they didn't have to beat us up. Mm. They okay. definitely were not afraid of us, I assure you. Two classics professors were not much of a threat. But it was like fear escalating fear in a yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. And because for one minute there, I I didn't realize how dangerous it was. And I didn't respond to the fear that this situation was could be resolved. Yeah, the, the reality is that we all have fear in us, some, mm -hmm. some form of fear. And there are moments in our lives when we have felt that fear. We can't say that we don't, we are completely fearless. The, the lesson in this book and what Gandhiji taught us is that how do you conquer, how do you, you, you know, suppress that fear, conquer the fear. And that, that is the most important thing. So Abhay, Abhay says, you know, that you are conquering fear. It's a negative. Bhai is fear and Abhay is uh, non-fear. So it's not a word that, you know, courage, which is a positive word. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to share. We have our intern here today, uh, Leah Cox. She's been um, doing such wonderful outreach for this event. So, and she has uh, a question for you. She's um, going to be going to college um, in in a couple of weeks. Hello. Um, I'm super grateful to be able to be here and just to be in your presence, even if it's through a screen. Um, but um, I have two questions. Um, my first one was about um, how do you use courage to remain happy without feeling guilty? And this stems from uh, sometimes like last night I was watching the Democratic National Convention and some of the things that they were saying made me happy and hopeful. Um, but a part of me was kind of, um, I felt guilty because there's so much horror in the world. And I know that um, American leadership has a big role to play in that horror. And I just kind of felt guilty for being happy um, about some of the things I was hearing. So I was wondering, um, how do you use courage to remain happy without feeling guilty? So um, for us, you know, growing up at Phoenix Settlement, we were taught one thing, that happiness, you know, without um, spending a lot of money, thinking about wealth and doing things that um, are not right is not happy. It's not happiness. Happiness comes from within you. You can, you can be satisfied that you've done the right thing, like going for a walk, like enjoying nature, like having a picnic, uh, you know, or all these things bring happiness. And there are so many little things that one can do in daily life to bring happiness in your life. So Gandhiji's life was never a sad life. Although he carried such a huge burden, he was always full of humor. And his life was a happy life. In South Africa, for instance, they used to often go for picnics, for nature walks, and talk about nature, how things, you know, talk about the trees and the plants and what they are, learn about them as you go for a walk. Um, and also doing things around the house. Um, you can think of it as drudgery, that you have to go and do these things, but you can also do it 
in a happy way. So happiness is within you. It's how you react to things. You can become sad and and um, think that your life is such a miserable life. Or <clears throat> you can be happy with little things in your pots and pans, looking at uh, cooking, looking at whatever little things that you want to do and find happiness in it. There's no need to feel guilty about it because you're not depriving other people. You're not exploiting somebody. You are not doing anything that makes you want to be guilty. Or, you know, so, so that's what happiness is about. Now, it's your conception of happiness because there are people whose conception of happiness revolves around how much of money they can spend and how expensive the gifts must be and so on. Thank you so much. Uh, that makes me feel a lot better. And um, like I've been trying to find little things around like my house, like you said, and just uh, like even if it's like something inspirational line that makes me happy. And so I um, try to appreciate that, but thank you. Um, and if I can ask my second question, um, it is, um, how do you find the courage to know when something is worth fighting for and when you should pause and take a breath? And this comes from uh, the fact that like my parents, um, they're very open-minded people, but there are some things that, you know, because of their age, um, they might be a little closed-minded about. And um, I'm someone who like will want to talk to them about it and try to open up their minds. And sometimes I feel like I get myself into a place where there's just not much more pushing I can do and I don't want to argue. Um, so I kind of have a hard time knowing when to let things go uh, when I feel like there's something I could do to give someone a different perspective. So um, from your experience and from your life, like how do you know when something is worth, you know, I guess arguing about or going back and forth with someone about um, or when it's time to just let it go and find peace and that you tried? A very difficult question. <laughs> I don't think there is one clear answer for that. I'm not sure if Michael can has an answer, but I don't. Um, I think it's more instinctive um, in the sense that, you know, you think that there are certain things where you have to assert yourself and to to say that this this is the right thing to do and that what you are doing is wrong. So that's one instance where, you know, you can be courageous, can point out, you know, what it is that you think is the, the correct thing. Um, again, you know, if you look at Gandhiji's uh, life, he uh, often, you know, um, expressed his, um, you know, his feelings about things, but then he left it to the other person to, to also argue and to, to decide for themselves whether they agree with him or they disagree with him. So you can't impose your will as well on other people. But there are certain things where, you know, it becomes necessary to point out that this is very wrong. Like, you know, if you see clear exploitation, clear, mm -hmm. uh, you know, lines that show you that this is wrong, then... <clears throat> you have to point that out. But there are many things where, you know, it could be either way. You regard something as wrong 
but the other person may feel that what they are doing is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And so you give them a chance to express themselves as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of things actually. Gandhiji was a genius at letting other people make their own mistakes. It was quite shocking for some of his immediate uh, followers and helpers, but he was uh, confident that if people made their own mistakes, they would learn from it. Uh, and to, as you were saying, Ila, to impose his view on them, even though he knew that his view was right and their view was wrong, imposing it on other people was counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And the other little thing I wanted to add, uh, Leah, I had this problem a lot. And uh, here's, I, as Ila says, I don't have an answer, but I have a strategy. Uh, I made it a point to not allow myself to act out of anger. And what that did was it forced me to overcome my anger because I wanted so badly to be able to act in a certain way to make a contribution. But I just kind of made a rule with myself. You're not going to do a thing until you get clear of this anger. Mm -hmm. And what I found was it motivated me to get over anger and fear mm -hmm. uh, very, very successfully. So thanks for bringing this up because I've forgotten about that. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to it. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you both. Um, so we are rounding out toward the end of uh, this time together. I'm after this, I'm going to give everybody a screening link for 24 hours to screen the third harmony from your own computer at your own home, um, because we find that that's the way that the um, that it works best and not everybody has time right now, but we want you to watch the film mm -hmm. too. In addition to the book, we'll give you a link to where you can buy the book. Um, but we want to bring up, um, our friend uh, Omar Hayat, he's here um, as part of the Gandhi Foundation who helped to co-sponsor um, and support this book. So I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about the Gandhi Foundation. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. It's so nice to see you, Ella. <laughs> um, just, just before uh, I start about the happiness uh, question, one of the things that I... And, and I think at the moment, on all of us, there's a heavy heart because of what is happening in Gaza and the Middle East in general. Uh, and I think it permeates into every part of our life at the moment. And so everything that we're doing doesn't feel as rich and as happiness filled as it should be. But what helps me at times to overcome that is try to look at the sweep of history. And when you look at the sweep of history, we all, as a, as a civilization, as a human species, mo are moving forward, whether it be human rights, women's rights, you know, how poverty is being eradicated, etc. And so there's a lot to look forward to, uh, as well as obviously when the pendulum swings a little in the opposite direction, you know, we all get very nervous and we all get very depressed about you know, the current issues. Um, but that's just personal to me, and you know, it kind of helps me cope a little, little better than uh, I might otherwise. Um, but it was a pleasure for the Gandhi Foundation to be associated in a small way, and I thank Asha for sending us that link from Stephanie, uh, and she, she's a wonderful friend of the Gandhi Foundation, and so the little contribution that we were able to make. And when I saw uh, the PDF of the of the book, it's such a wonderful book. And I think it's a lot more than just the overcoming of fear. The fact that Gandhi gave up a relatively comfortable life, went off to live in you know, relative poverty and hardship, uh, talks about, you know, giving up material things in terms of a higher purpose. Uh, and we can all uh, very much learn from that. I know uh, one of the quotes that's uh, attributed to him, 
maybe you can correct me if I'm if I, if it's not where he says live simply so others may simply live and I know that has had an enormous impact I mean in the I was I'm an engineer PhD by a profession but I've been running a, a business for a very long time and that quote helped me tremendously to keep going back to what is important and what is not and and it's not a a one off it's a constant struggle on a more or less on a daily basis that okay do i really need this material thing do i really need to do that do i really need to cut that person's salary so i can make another you know 20 pounds extra or whatever it is uh and i think gandhi you right michael was an absolute genius There's so many, so many quotes from him that when you look at it, you realize the depth of the quote, whether it's you know, the quote about the talisman, whether it's this or the world has enough for its needs, but not for a single person's greed, et cetera. I mean, just so many is, you know, uh, it's uh, remarkable that one single human being was able to come with so many, so much uh, uh, to teach us. Um, And in a small way, I think the Gandhi Foundation here exists uh, to uh, this, uh, promote the work of Gandhi in a modern setting. So we're no longer living in small farms. What, how is his uh, message relevant to a metropolis like London or, or you know, an advanced society like the UK or US and so forth? And it is. And, and our job, I, I suppose, is to try to get that message. And your book, I think, is, hits it on the nail. The production of it is wonderful. I love the coloring schemes in it. I love the simplicity of the book and the way it's written. It's, yes, <laughs> the, way, the way it's written. And it's a bit like the, if you've read the book, The Little Prince, where a child can read it and, you know, lovely, beautiful story. And an adult can read it and read a lot more into it. So congratulations, a lovely, lovely book. And thank you for involving the Gandhi Foundation in it. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, this, this has been a wonderful time together. Thank you so much for your time today, Ila, and to all of our attendees and guests and people who will see this later. Um, thank you for taking your time to think about nonviolence and courage. And as we leave, I, I would I'd like to invite you to think about taking an act of courage today. <laughs> and what will that be? So as you leave, um, just take some time to consider that, to plant the seed in your heart. And I hope that that seed flowers immediately um, sometime today, even if it's already evening, where you are at, there's still time in the day to do something with courage and love. Um, I have put some links in the chat. I hope everybody has can see them, but I have linked to the Third Harmony film, which will be open at that password for 24 hours. Um, so please watch that film at some point and ask yourself the question about the relationship between nonviolence and courage as you're watching it. Um, the password to that link is META, M-E-T-T-A, uh, where you can buy the book is um, at our bookstore, metacenter.org bookstore. Um, we invite you to follow us on Instagram, where we're going to be talking about more about nonviolence and courage. Um, so, yes, thank you so much, everybody, um, for being here. And um, if you have any questions about anything related to nonviolence, I'm sure you can reach out to the Gandhi Foundation. Um, is that info at GandhiFoundation.org? Yes. Okay. Um, as well as the Meta Center, info at MetaCenter.org. And we can also forward um, your questions to Ela if you send them to us too. So we can uh, we can help you with that, Ela. And our friend Amory said he's willing to bring the books to South Africa. So. Oh. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, any last words for us, Ila, as we as we sign off? Well, I see uh, my friend uh, Mohan Bhai has mm -hmm. mentioned that, uh, you know, when Gandhiji was a little boy, very young, 
he uh, used to, uh, you know, um, talk about his fears to his maid or his nanny who used to look after him. And she taught him to overcome the fear by uttering the word Ram, Ram, Ram. And that would uh, help him to overcome the fear. So I think it's, uh, you know, it just shows that we all have different ways. We can each practice some way in which we can overcome fear. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, um, and Mohan, you wanted to say a few words about the two books um, during yeah. Narayan Bay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Eleven. Namaskar. Uh, I really am grateful. Uh, and very fortunate uh, that uh, we have this beautiful occasion uh, to celebrate and get inspired by your own uh, life and experiences. And we are delighted uh, that uh, you were able to put together the story and extremely grateful to Meta Center, especially uh, Michael Bhai and uh, my dear sister, uh, Stephanie. And what I wanted to mention are a couple of things. One is, uh, according to Gandhiji's recollection, and now this is clear even in my own life, that he credits uh, two ladies, uh, one, his wife, <laughs> and the second, the lady who took care of him, as the teachers of courage to him for him. I look at you <laughs> and others, uh, the ladies in my life, and I do see that, uh, that there is something uniquely powerful in the presence of these ladies. Uh, so uh, uh, that's something important. And I think sometimes we uh, uh, get, especially my gender, uh, some kind of a sense of uh, superiority that we should not be looking at the other gender uh, for learning these important life lessons. The second thing I wanted to bring out is the great uh, uh, coincidence, uh, or providential coincidence, that this is the birth anniversary of Narayan Kaka, whom all of you know, Narayan Bhai Desai. And uh, next week, uh, I will be going to Vedchi because they have organized the 100-year celebratory events. And really, thanks to my dear Stephanie, she was able to figure out uh, how we can publish uh, uh, your book uh, as well as uh, her book, uh, the beautiful book. And these are all for children, basically. Gandhi Searches for Truth, uh, the Meta Center publication, which came out a few years ago. And it will be. Uh, remarkable thing is that the publication house that Narayan Kaka had established uh, 70 years ago, Yagne Prakashan, is bringing it out, and we plan to uh, distribute this among students, young students, mostly Adivasi girls, in the ashram and the school that Kaka used to teach, as well as Jugadram uh, Dada in Vedchi. That's where the Bardoli Satyagra uh, days have happened 100 years ago, approximately. So, uh, uh, great uh, uh, occasion, and I think. Uh, uh, really extremely grateful for all of you, uh, you for being the uh, author and the narrator of your precious memories, uh, and Michael Bai and uh, Stephanie uh, for yes. the torch bearer uh, of these stories. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That's amazing. And um, safe travels to you. Okay, everybody. This has been a wonderful event. We're going to sign off. We wish you uh, the best as you take your act of courage today. Let us know how it goes. Watch the film. Let us know what you think of it. And um, we're happy to continue working with everybody. So please stay in touch. Thank you.